In this episode of The Fintech Files, we go on a deep dive into data and ethics in the investment management space with Bill Kelly, Chairman and CEO of the Chartered Alternative Investment Analyst Association, starting with, with a question from your host, George Eliferis, about the current investment landscape. I'll offer a quote from the CEO of Apollo, Global Asset Management, one of the biggest firms in the alternative investment space, who was saying something like, with fintech, with democratization, with new market dynamics, I suppose he's referring to GME, it's an amazing backdrop for the alternative investment space. So what does that make you think? A few things. It, it makes me think that is a statement made by a, a capitalist who's trying to serve uh, two masters, as, as Jack Vogel would say, that a, a GP's got a business and partners and profits uh, to generate and to give back to shareholders and partners. But there's a client on the other side. And what does this mean for the end client? And to say, hey, isn't it wonderful you now have act? There's both opportunities and enormous risks uh, associated with that. And I think it's a responsibility for the fiduciary, the GP, to point both sides out. And we talked about uh, private equity a few minutes ago, George, but another point that, that you, you and your listeners will know quite well is the amount of dry powder commitments these institutional LPs have made that haven't been invested, which all things being equal, the alpha in private equity starts to feel and sound a lot more like beta. If I've got all these efficiencies and all this dry powder and every portfolio company I'm looking at is subject to an auction, the complexity premium and the illiquidity premium are going to shrink as a result of that. So I think that we've got to celebrate and recognize the fact that in the U.S., uh, the public equity markets might be, I don't know, $30, $40 trillion, and private equity is uh, maybe $5 trillion. So there's still a lot of running room and growing room and a lot of small companies that, that need to change hands. And there's only 3,500 public companies listed in the U.S. and many times that in the private market. So clearly there's opportunity there. But I think we're at a, a point of inflection where we should sit back and take stock and be very careful about how we're selling the value proposition and make sure we balance that against some of the risks involved. So perhaps that brings us to our the role of ethics in the space. And I'll start by quoting what you generally find I have at the end of your blogs, which is seek education, diversify, sorry, I'll start again. Seek education, diversity of both your portfolio and people, know your risk tolerance. Investing is for the long term, very sound advice. And it's a good transition for the part on ethics because I think it can be read in two different ways investment advice, diversification, etc. But there's also something ethical, something Aristotelian about this. It's very much about one's character. And why is that so central to all your content? So I, I started writing this blog called What About Beta probably about I don't know, several years ago. And I think I was always, despite uh, what I said about my dad about a career, I think I was like my younger brother, John, a frustrated English major. And I've always liked to write. And when I came into Kaya, my colleague at the time, Chris Holt, who had created this all about alpha platform. And, and as I looked at it and learned about it, I said to Chris, I think that was an interesting naming convention back in the early 2000 timeframe. But it's not all about alpha anymore. It's much more complex than that. And particularly as we get more democratization into the mix, I think the goal should be at least to try to get uh, undifferentiated beta in the hands of the end investor. And if we can do that right, then we can start talking about alpha. But the concept of today's alpha is tomorrow's beta, I think there's a lot of truth to that as well, because I mentioned before, all this efficiency coming into the private uh, markets, it makes it a lot more challenging to get a differentiated return. So when I started writing this, I came up with that tagline. I'm not sure how and why I did. It was probably the influence of many mentors and things I read over the years, and it just stuck. And I added the diversification of people more recently because of our commitment there. And I was asked to do a, a pretty high visibility panel, as an example, uh, in New York in a few weeks. And, and the only woman panelist dropped. And I said, well, if she's not on it, I'm not doing the panel anymore. 
And I think they were very surprised to say, well, look at all this firepower. And I said, you know what? I'm not going to be representative of the problem. I need to be representative of the solution going forward. So I simply refused to sit on that panel. So I, I added the diversity of people because I think that's an important part of our mission and our focus as well. But getting back to the point at hand about uh, uh, security and data, you have to look no further. And I don't know when people are going to see this, uh, this uh, podcast, George, but no further than today's Wall Street Journal, and it's October 6th in the morning in the Northeast here. And above the fold on page one is Facebook. And uh, there was a whistleblower initiative in place. It was on 60 Minutes, and then this whistleblower testified in front of Congress. And I don't understand all the moving parts, but ultimately, Facebook has put profits over safety. And that's a horrible thing, even as a shareholder, but even worse as a stakeholder. So as we are entering this brave new world of data and ethics, and every single thing has been digitized, and especially in this, uh, this COVID lockdown, everything's been on Zoom, and the footprint and the exhaust coming out of the footprint is going to be there forever. So, the, so everything we've said and done has been documented. Uh, there's been really no private conversations over the last 18 months, and we've got to make sure that this data is used in a very ethical and responsible way. And I think it's going to be easy for uh, a manager to say, you know what, I can use this to generate short-term alpha and nobody's going to notice. And I think the hallmark of a true professional, a true fiduciary, is doing the right thing when nobody's looking. Because someday you're going to have to reconcile this with yourself reconcile with a regulator, reconcile with an end client, and there's no substitute to doing the right thing. I believe in capitalism, full stop, but it's got to be struck with the right balance of putting a client first. And, and I think with the advent of all this data, it's become a lot more complex to uh, live by that credo. So this is a very important uh, statement, but how does an organization go about implementing it and making it, fitting it through all its process. It's quite complicated and most notably because as I said to you before, the fact that we are a, a great industry, but we're not a profession. And you don't have to have a credential. You don't have to have signed an ethical oath to be running money in this industry, which is really, if you think about that for a moment, it's quite remarkable. And could you imagine having open heart surgery from a physician that was not board certified uh, in cardiology. I simply wouldn't do it. Or a public accounting firm signing off as an independent auditor that was not a certified public accountant that has taken an oath. So uh, it may be somewhat a gimmicky, George, but I talk to a lot of students and I try to pay it forward by giving back. And ethics is a big part of my presentation to them. And at the very end, and I use this slide consistently, I'm doing two in the next couple of weeks, and this slide has stayed in this deck, even though I've updated some of the financial underpinning. It's a, a bust of the Greek head of Hippocrates. And I'll say to the students, does anybody know who this is? And, and usually in a classroom, you could see somebody did know and you call them virtually, it's a little bit more difficult, but nine and a half times out of 10, nobody says anything. And I say, it's, it's the bust of Hippocrates. And every doctor, certainly in the U.S. and maybe around the world, when they graduate med school, they have to take a Hippocratic oath, which is vows tied to ethics. And I know it reasonably well because, as I said before, my wife's a physician and my son, uh, Zach, is a surgeon. So I've been to two med school graduations and have heard this oath twice. And one of the things you vow to is to avoid therapeutic nihilism which is fancy wording for the cure is more harmful than good. So if you've got a cancer-ridden patient that has had a heart attack, are you going to do open heart surgery on that patient? No, they, 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 it's going to do more harm than good. So I bring this parallel back to our industry, and I look at this massive pile of dry powder that's now been sitting there for several years, and the risk on trade is persisting. And is there not at least uh, a discussion where some GP should go back to the public pension plan and say, you know what, here's your money back. It's not a good time to invest. The market is not priced correctly, and I'm not going to put this money to work and tie it up for seven years because I'm pretty sure if I have to put it to work at 22, 23 times EBITDA, I don't think I can get you a fair return. And I think that that would be awesome. That headline would be extraordinary. It would be one of the best marketing plays I've ever seen. But uh, so far, nobody's been willing to, uh, to take me up on that dare. But I think it does underscore, again, 
that this is a, a great industry, it's not a profession, and we've got to think more and more about putting the client first. And maybe fall all the way back to that, uh, that phrase that I closed my blog post, putting uh, the client first and thinking about the long-term nature of investing. These are part of the ethical underpinnings that should drive us as professionals with or without that Hippocratic oath. Yes, uh, being Greek, I like the metaphor. <laughs> One thing that you mention a lot is client first. So how does that help or how does that solve the, this ethics problem and how can you use it in a very pragmatic way? Yeah, so I, I think the use and abuse of data goes back uh, decades and I'm not going to have the story completely directly, it's spot on uh, and I've used this as an example for, so I've done some of these boot camps with NASA scientists and certainly they're a hell of a lot smarter than I am but I try to preach to them the importance of, of bringing solid ethics into our industry. So as the story goes, I use this concept of the talking Barbie doll, which uh, came out, I don't know, in the 1970s. I think I remember some of my sisters had it. And the first concept of the talking Barbie had artificial intelligence in there. So it was wired in such a way that it understood if you asked the talking Barbie, what's your favorite color? It understood that question, it could come back with the word blue. But it, it could not machine learn. It just understood these questions. But mm -hmm. over time, Mattel, I think, was the company. They hired somebody from, I think, from Google or Microsoft. And all of a sudden, Talking Barbie was not, had a capitalist tendencies, even though it looked like this innate doll. So it would not only ask, answer the question of blue, it may, might then follow up and say, where does daddy work? What kind of car does mommy drive? And it's going to accumulate all of this knowledge that they can sell to somebody else. So you buy this talking Barbie and all of a sudden you realize that the talking Barbie owns you and is taking advantage of you and product gets pushed you away. So the concept of, and I, I just shake my head in, in amazement that I'll be having a conversation with my wife about going down to see my daughter in Atlanta and let's go get an Airbnb. Next thing I opened my Instagram account. And it's got an advertisement from Airbnb on there. Like, how the hell did they know that? And, and I might have texted my wife that they pull this whole thing together. I guess we accept that as consumers. And there's some level of convenience attached. To it. But if I know, George, if I have an algorithm that knows any time the market goes down 2%, it goes up 5 I already know from a behavioral standpoint how George is going to react to this. And if I'm going to use this as a tool to bring another product toward you, that again is not how you're going to build wealth, be constantly trading in and out of strategy. So I think that we can use some of this data to maybe de-risk an investment process. The, comp the concept of operational alpha by having more efficiencies and lowering my expenses. The concept of getting somebody like you or me involved not so much in the private markets but get involved early on in the capital formation process and, the, and that's another important theme which i'll just mention in park here but happy to explore more capital formation and value creation is a private matter it is really the concept of happening in the private markets i, I spoke at our old uh, seattle conference just last week and i used the example of warby parker the, the eyeglass maker it's a, it's a great brand they went through a series g round and the series g raise was in august of 20, uh, 2020 so just about a year ago and with that raise they put a two billion dollar valuation in war along comes last week they come out as a public company and when the market closed in that very first day of trading it was uh, valued at just under seven uh, billion dollars so more than a triple from august of last year you might say, well, that's awesome for the investor that was able to buy in early. Not so much. This was not an IPO, it was a DPO, a direct public offering. They were not looking to raise a dime of new capital. It was the VCs and the private equity owners and management were selling 100% of the sell velocity was coming from them to the end investor. And the end investor was probably by and large buying it at a $6 billion valuation. So good for the founders, Maybe good, maybe not so much for the end investor. Could there be another turn of growth? Yes, but the early capital formation was here. So when I think about accessing private equity, you want to find ways of helping the investor get in early on in that process. And, uh, and maybe one last point, and I'll pause on this, George. It, it, we, we're talking a lot about DeFi and disruptive technologies, and I think it's unfortunate that a lot of the conversation has been centered on the, the cryptocurrencies, these exchange tokens. 
and and I think that's where everybody's focus is. But the security tokens, I think, are very interesting. And again, there, I think you get it wrong because we talk about security tokens and we talk about this artist called Beeple and Sotheby's uh, selling this painting for $69 million. But I look at the concept of a security token. I think it's today and tomorrow's stock certificate. So if you and I come together on a distributed ledger and decide we want to transact on a specific name, we could do it right now. T plus one would be as long as it took us to agree to it and it gets validated on the blockchain and off we go. But yet we have to do that in a public market today. And it takes bizarrely two days for that trade to settle. And this a centralized custodian, a centralized record keeper. But I think that this security token, I think it's going to be a very interesting thing to watch. And if we could use that security token to get the investor access to the Warby Parkers when it's worth $300 million, $500 million, so they can enjoy some of that value creation, I think it's going to be an awesome thing. So ultimately, the, the pace of disruption and change in our industry, let's say just going back a handful of years over maybe the next five, so these, you drop the parentheses in and say over a decade around where we are now, it's going to be unlike anything we've seen in the last century. I, I think that is what I'm seeing, and I think most of your listeners could uh, relate to that as well. And it, it is really incumbent upon us to make sure that we are in this game, upskilling, cross-skilling, and understanding what is going on in this industry. So many interesting things there. I think the, the educational part is very relevant to the example of the IPO, and should we just jump into IPOs, or should we have a more nuanced, a more educated approach and understand the mechanics uh, and the value creation process. It also brings me to something we discussed earlier, which is about the longevity risk that is now with us, not just with defined liabilities and things like that. So is that where, for example, our participation potentially through tokenization in the growth stories, is that linked to how we also, one aspect of how we deal with longevity risk and how we potentially become more active as investors to match our own life liabilities. And I think it ties back to my earlier observation, George, about you know, if you were my client, uh, let's talk about the liability side of your balance sheet first. And I don't think the industry and us as individuals are paying nearly enough attention to outcomes and what it means post-retirement. And uh, we've got great access to healthcare, certainly in this country and I think around the world. And the concept myself uh, personally, my parents are still alive, they're 91 years old. So all things being equal, my expectation should be, and I think I'm in uh, a better uh, health than they were at my age, I could live another 30, 40 years. So if I decide in the good old days, I'm 61 years old, I think my dad retired at six, that I have three to four decades of living still and five kids that have expectations and weddings. And, and I think I'm done with, uh, no, we're not quite done. My youngest one's not in college yet, but done with the tuition bills to some degree. But I think we've got to be focused on the outcome solutions and, and what happens uh, post-retirement. And in the good old days, I could annuitize my portfolio at some point and think about uh, fixed income. That's a non-starter. That I think we're forcing, because of this Fed intervention and central bank intervention around the world, we're forcing people in their 70s and 80s to take uh, uh, systematic risk that maybe they shouldn't be taking at, at that level and because it's, uh, it's, the drawdown potential is enormous. So I don't think we've thought about the long-term consequences, which gets back to maybe the quote and what about beta, that we have legislation, politicians, regulators, and in many cases, asset managers that are thinking too short term. What is the product you want today? You want liquidity? I'll give you liquidity. Versus really trying to educate that person about what are the long term implications. And that's certainly, I'm not sure we're going to have time to get into it today, but uh, solving for climate. And I could trade in and out of the public equity markets today, and I could be doing the right thing and avoiding uh, the sin stocks or trying to influence their outcome. But if my holding period is a couple of weeks or six months, I'm not being compensated for the avoidance or taking in the risk part of climate. But unless we do something collectively, we're going to wake up one day and it's not going to be somebody dying from a virus. It's going to be somebody dying because they can't catch their next breath or there's a forest fire at their doorstep that we can't put out anymore. That is going to be a bad outcome. So we as investors have got to be thinking long term on many fronts in terms of, of demographics, our retirement, climate crisis, the list goes on and on. And very few people are focused on that.
Yes, and it's very interesting. We talk about we as investors, and to me, this also now means something different than it was perhaps a few years ago when we talked about investors, we talked about professionals. It seems nowadays um, investing, at least for those who have the, the chance to have some disposable income, could potentially get a much greater importance in our lives and as part of our income as well. And and that's where it all, I think, as well come together, the longevity risk, the need for education, and the... Um, let's say, responsibility towards climate change and, and other ethical issues. Yeah, and that's all true. And I, I did a panel just yesterday on climate, and I made the parallels with COVID. And, uh, and COVID, if there was ever a real fire drill for how the world is going to come together, behave and react to a global crisis, a good old fashioned pandemic is probably as close as you're going to get to, to figuring it out. And I don't belittle that. This was a crisis personally and professionally for so many people. I got COVID myself in March of 2020, coming back from Europe, shared it with my wife, but fortunately we both, both came back out the other side just fine, But it's, uh, so I'm not belittling it. But it did show us how we're reacting and how we will react to this. And it doesn't give me great confidence in the short term, because what did we do as individuals or what did we do as corporate America? We turned to the sovereign and we said to the sovereign, you need to spray liquidity at this. You need to go and find a vaccine. You need to fix. And it's remarkable that we have vaccines, not and it, it's been spotty in terms of availability in the emerging market countries as an example. I think it's a really quite poor where they are versus the rest of the developed world, and we must uh, do better there. But then at the end of the day, the last mile is up to us as individuals, and the same is true for climate. And the sovereign, uh, although they didn't put it this way, but basically I did all this stuff you want. I stimulated the hell out of the economy. I wrote individual checks to all of you. I pushed interest rates down to zero. I got the airlines uh, back up and running, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I just need you to do uh, one or two things for me. Could you get vaccinated and you could wear a mask? And I think the, the public basically, certainly in the U.S., said maybe not. And it's become a bit of a, a political statement. So I think that these problems are very hard to solve. And unless we're willing to take both collective and individual responsibilities for them, it is going to be very difficult. So I think, first off, recognizing the problem is important. And then we've got to collectively uh, figure out how we're going to deal with it. And, and uh, maybe if I just put a capstone in this whole conversation, George, I think this is a great tour. Uh, I enjoyed it quite a bit. One of my earliest mentors said to me, before you do anything, what would the client think? And, and that has stuck with me. I don't know if uh, he meant to do it or not, but it's been tattooed on my brain. And uh, everything I say here, everything I write, every conversation I have, that sort of resonates in a very strong way to me. What would the client think? And as we think about all these great tools and these problems we need to solve, we've got to think about stakeholders and, uh, and what would the client think? What would the stakeholder think? And if the answer is I'm not sure or I don't think they're going to leave, you've got to change your behavior. So I, I think that's something that has stuck with me. And I think if, if even half the world could be thinking that way, we'd be in a better place. So maybe that is just a bit of uh, closing advice or tip. And maybe some of your listeners will pick up on it and the world will be a better place. Yeah, and that, that's a very practical and useful, let's call it a hack. If you're not sure, if in doubt, you can ask yourself that question. Yes, absolutely. All right. Thank you so much, Bill. I'll say to the listeners that the Kaya now is not just an accreditation. There's also so many resources that you put out there and that are very easily accessible. So I would recommend to anyone to, to check it out. And I'll put the links in the description. Thank you so much, uh, Bill, for all those insights and reflection, really, on the world we live in. Outstanding. I enjoyed the conversation, George. Thanks for having me on. Thank you very much, Bill. It's been a great pleasure.